Anyway, let's get started so we don't overrun. Um, well, hello everybody, and thank you very much for tuning in to this week's Wednesday webinar. Now, um, our regular viewer would have noticed that I am most definitely not Stephanie Fox, who normally hosts these events. Uh, for some really bizarre reason, we decided to give her a day off today, but hey, what the hell. Um, so anyway, my name is Paul Squirrel, and I'm a director at the Network One, and um, I'd uh, very much like to welcome you to today's webinar, which I will be attempting to moderate. Okay, so before we get started, I just wanted to share a little bit of the, uh, the housekeeping, and apologies, because I know some of you have probably heard all of this before, um, our regular viewers, as it were. So here we go. Uh, we are going to be running this webinar for about 55 minutes. There's a five minute intro. Uh, there'll be about a 35, 40 minute presentation from our speaker. Um, we'll have a Q&A at the end, and we'll leave you about five minutes so you can get ready for your next virtual appointment. We'd be very grateful if you keep your microphones on mute at all times, and we'll unmute your microphone when we're calling on you to ask a question. That being said, we'd really love it if you'd leave your cameras on. Uh, so uh, Simon, our speaker, has some happy smiley faces to look at whilst he's presenting. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, but if you come up with any questions in the meantime, if you pop them in the chat, um, I can either ask them for you, or if you put ask, I want to ask directly, I'll call upon you to ask directly. If you have any technical issues, um, you can email me directly at paul.squirrel at the network one.com, or you can leave the message in the chat as well. In the unlikely event that the system crashes, uh, please wait a couple of minutes and then use the same link that you had earlier to log in, to log back into the system and hopefully everything will be fine. Okay, thank you. That's the technical stuff over and done with. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to our guest speaker, the wonderful Dr. Simon Moore, BSc, PhD, then a whole bunch of other letters. He's a very smart guy. Simon is a, a chartered psychologist and the managing partner with award-winning UK-based psychological insight and behavioral inter innovation, intervention consultancy, Innovation Bubble. In his work, Simon specializes in bringing the latest psychological knowledge about people, emotions, decisions, and their needs to agencies and clients to help them understand how the psychology of decision-making and behavioral change, which can, can generate new business, improve existing customer relationships and overall brand engagement. Innovation Bubble's award-winning cutting-edge tools are currently used by Ogilvy, Edison, Iris, Proximity, Golin, as well as brands like Sony, Microsoft, Diesel, Ted Baker, FedEx, HSBC, and Coca-Cola, to name but a few. So it gives me very great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Simon Moore. Simon, the floor is entirely yours. Thank you, Paul. No pressure after that introduction then. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I know there's some people around the world that are joining us, which is always nice, and I, some familiar faces as well. Uh, so uh, hello again. Um, so yeah, so as Paul said, what we're going to try and do is, I have to apologise to start with, because we're going to be doing around 60 years of psychology uh, in a little less than uh, 45 minutes, if I can manage it. So a, a kind of a flick book kind of presentation, really. So uh, what I'm going to try and do, though, is kind of cover four main areas, as I'll get on to in a second. But just as a quick introduction. For those of you who may not be familiar with me, uh, as Paul said, uh, I'm a psychologist. Uh, I've probably been helping brands and agencies, uh, well, probably for the best part of uh, 25 years now. So it's, it's gone quite quickly. It's been quite fun, though, which is quite nice. But I originally started off helping um, uh, wildlife conservation. So... Uh, I uh, sort of cut my teeth on, uh, not literally, but cut my teeth on monkeys and dolphins and uh, how we could probably kind of look at their behaviours and see about breeding programmes that we could release back out into the wild. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, animals are not that dissimilar to humans. So it allowed me to kind of cross over into the human space and kind of look at the whys of human behavior and that's kind of what we're really interested in here is why do people do stuff and what why don't they do stuff and I think you'll probably agree as agency people you've probably got enough of the what's so you know you have a lot of data about what the customer does 
you know, their demographics, their age, for example, what they might put in their basket, how long they might spend online, um, and what they post up on various social media and things. But it doesn't tell you the whys of those things. And without that, really, you can't create these intervention points that might stick or have longer, you know, kind of a, a longer kind of time span of application and kind of ROI. So that's what we bring to the table. We don't try to replace anything. I suppose we try to augment. And we do it in two ways from an agency point of view. So one, we actually help agencies with that capability as I'll demonstrate to you. And the second thing we do, we use that kind of skill set also to try and kind of win agencies kind of clients, which is obviously quite nice to do. Um, so from a kind of a what, why do we do what we do point of view, I mean, the agency that I run is a bit strange in the fact that it is all psychologists. And you can probably gather that makes quite interesting meetings, sometimes quite long meetings. Um, but the reason we decided to do that was that Psychology is a little bit like medicine in the fact that you have lots of different sub-disciplines. And so, you know, if I've got one psychologist or if I'm lucky and I've got two, you know, they only really cover a couple of areas. I might be lucky to have a social psychologist or a personality psychologist. That covers some elements of the puzzle, but there are a lot of other dimensions that are kind of missing really. And so we made a conscious kind of decision to actually recruit specialists in all the main areas of psychology so that we could have quite a kind of accurate picture of what kind of consumers and employees kind of do so um and our and our kind of specialism really is looking at the non-conscious spaces okay so the hidden kind of influences on decisions so I think a lot of people are familiar with lots of traditional research methods. So, you know, interviews, questionnaires and surveys, and they have their place and they're quite useful. However, what they cannot do is unlock these kind of more influential kind of non-conscious influences on decision making. And we know these non-conscious factors are really important because uh, there was a study that was conducted by Harvard, took about a 15 year time span. And they put various people in kind of these MRI scanners to look at what parts of the brain activated when they were given certain problems or certain things to think about. And they used medical consultants and financial advisors and general consumers and managers. And what they found to their surprise was, was quite shocking that 90% of the time, it was the non-conscious part of the brain that was kind of being very active and quite dominant in that decision. Now, when they asked the people why they were making those decisions, they were kind of pretty inarticulate in how they could actually talk about why they'd come to reach their conclusion or their actual decision that they made. And this is because while the non-conscious is really powerful, the clues in the title really, we're not really aware of what influences us. And we probably give ourselves much more credit that we are quite independent and in control of our decisions because it's quite scary to think about that we're, we're quite automatic and autonomous in the way that we go about stuff. But there is a reason for that, and it kind of linked to survival really, that if we had to think about everything, as we shall see, we'd be very tired quite quickly, and our brains would probably fry within about half an hour of you getting out of bed in the morning, because it kind of gives us too much cognitive overload. Okay, so some things it makes sense for us to throw into the automatic, to allow our kind of, subconscious system to process without us giving too much attention, too much energy to. So as I said, we work wherever there are humans. Uh, these are some of the clients that we've worked with and some of the uh, clients that we've helped agencies work with. So it, it makes no difference to us what sector it is. Uh, you know, the, com the commonality is having a human in front of us. And the nice thing is that humans from my point of view, not yours necessarily, but from my point of view, humans are much more similar uh, than dissimilar. And I think we actually think it's the opposite. We think that we're kind of well-rounded, quite kind of different individuals. And we are to some extent, 
However, we are more similar, we'll have more similarities amongst ourselves than we have differences. And for me, that's useful because it means I can simplify the landscape in terms of the consumer or the employee insights. Uh, and I don't have to have things like, you know, 65 different persona categories, which is a nonsense to kind of help out the clients and agencies in that space. I can actually really boil it down into much more kind of smaller groups with kind of better impact. And I'll show you some case studies as we move through on this. So look, the psychology works, okay? So here's three kind of top line examples of what happened when we kind of got involved on various projects here. Um, you know, you can have some really kind of big numbers that change. I mean, I had to ask the Ted Baker CMO three times to repeat the figure to me about what happened after we kind of did our interventions. I thought, first of all, I thought he said 15%, which I would have been pleased with, uh, but he said 50% increase in sales across the general global market in terms of our interventions. I mean, that's a phenomenal figure. And I think when I say that to a lot of people, they just don't believe it um, because they're not used to those kind of big changes. And that's probably getting back to my earlier point about the fact that we do enact change, but a lot of the change is based on conscious, rational kind of measurement. If we can bring the non-conscious into these things, then we can increase these numbers beyond the five to sort of nine percent that we're typically kind of interested in and see. So it's really kind of impactful, this non-conscious stuff. And hopefully in the next sort of half an hour, you'll actually see how we kind of get to it and you'll actually see how it works as well. And I'm going to get you to do some stuff purely so you don't have to listen to me all the time. But I think sometimes it's quite fun and I learn by doing stuff. Uh, and I think that's the best way to kind of realize and remember so there's some points that we might be making here. So in terms of um, what we do, I mean, we do quant and qual. We've got lots of bespoke sort of psychology based kind of tools. And these sit alongside existing data sets. OK, so we're not interested in throwing things out and kind of overriding things. What we're trying to do is add in the psychology dimension here. And for an agency, create that differential pitch, or for an agency who's working with a client, create really impactful insights and interventions that their client will want to go back to them again. And as a result of that, they differentiate amongst the kind of crowded agency market. And that's kind of you know, what we do. We'll decide whether you know, there's a qualitative angle to this or the quantitative angle might be useful. And I'll, I'll show you some of these in action so you can actually see the impact of these as well as we kind of move through. So what are we going to cover then in the next half an hour? Well, I thought it might be quite interesting to kind of cover four areas, really. Um, and these are kind of maybe counterintuitive to start with, or they might be kind of something you're familiar with. But why do emotions sell more than pragmatics? And what I mean by pragmatics are things like pricing, discounts, quality, amount. Okay, these are very kind of fact, pragmatic driven communications. And what we know is that the consumers and employees actually lean into and are more persuaded by these feelings, these emotional kind of contact points. Then I'm going to move over to why we are kind of wrong to assume that humans are very rational, conscious and have kind of brains like computers. I certainly don't have one that's like that, um, because if we think about things in that way, we're actually going to go wrong at the very beginning in terms of what insights we might collect. And this is why when you talk to CMOs, they're a little bit under when you get in the lift with them, when they're out of the boardroom, they'll actually admit they're a little bit underwhelmed about what the agency might have done. OK, it might have ticked the box and it might have kept, you know, the head above water, but it wasn't a kind of like, wow, that was amazing kind of moment. And I think this is why, you know, the agency world is shifting in, in the terms of like, you know, people are getting appointed, then dropped, then reappointed and dropped again. And we're seeing quite a kind of big kind of turnover of agency work and clients who are using different agencies because they're looking for that holy grail of kind of let's go beyond the yeah that that was okay i want to know that, that was really interesting kind of kind of reaction to then we're kind of moving to the middle section which is why do agencies and clients almost overcomplicate the customer segmentation area it's actually quite simple um and so we'll show you how we can actually go about this in a much more simple way 
that actually has quite significant impacts on marketing, kind of market growth, retention, uh, and lowering churn rates, for example. And then we'll end on, you know, why is it that we kind of beaver away on projects and these lovely agency outputs, and we're really proud of them, and we should be because it's good work, yet actually our consumers either don't use it in the way we designed it, don't interact with it, uh, or don't actually have the impact in terms of the behavioral outcome that we were designing. Why is that? What's going on there in their kind of brains in terms of why is that kind of blocking what you intended to happen? So let's start with a, why do your emotions kind of uh, engage you in something more than the kind of features and, and the facts? I'm not saying facts and kind of pricing and discounts aren't important. What I'm saying to you is they're not important probably in the moments or in the timings that you might use them. Uh, and certainly lots of clients are guilty of this, that they will lead on these things. And actually they do more harm than good sometimes from a psychology point of view. So look, let's take an example. Uh, some of you uh, have got glasses on. Uh, I can see if you look around the screens, you can probably see that many of you, I think all of you don't have the same pair of glasses on. So if we think about glasses in terms of what's the pragmatic solution we're looking for when we are looking to buy a pair of glasses, I would imagine most of you would say to be able to see better. So it's the lens that's important. Okay, now, if that was the case and it was just about pragmatics, then what would happen is we would only need one frame. Okay, the lens would change, but the way the glasses look, it wouldn't matter because it's all about seeing better. Now, what we know about the psychology of kind of ophthalmology ophthalmology is the fact that that's not true actually the big seller is the frame okay so actually the style the color the shape this is what creates the emotional engagement do i look intelligent do i fit in do i stand out do i look sexy whatever it might be this also explains why many people who should wear glasses don't own a pair of glasses because it's the emotional feeling of I'm, I, I'm not comfortable, with, I, I'm gonna look in a certain way, I'm gonna look silly. Yeah, I'm not gonna look sexy with glasses on, whatever that might be. Okay, so emotionality is kind of really, really important here. And actually, if you look at the research in the last 20 years of neuroscience, if I was gonna be conservative, it would actually say that emotions outweigh the pragmatics by at least four to one, which is a massive figure. Okay, so if we can lead on emotions, we get people's attention, we get that relevancy, we get that engagement, and then once we have their time and attention, then we can feed them facts and figures, okay? So you're not gonna get someone's attention necessarily just by feeding these kind of very pragmatic, fact-based messages, because people are busy, as we shall see, they're, twice, they're time constrained, they're quite stressed, they're juggling lots of things. Why should they drop everything just to listen to what you're saying to it? If you can make them feel a certain way, then your feelings dominate your behavioral outcomes. So then they're kind of like, oh, this is making me kind of interested, or this is making me feel happy, or this is making me feel reassured. Now I've got some attention to give you here. So let's give you an example. And one of my big bugbears here, I've got many of them, but I'm not gonna bore you with all of them, I'll give you one. So we've probably heard the word frictionless. And everyone wants an easy, you know, you talk to your clients, and they'll all say, we want to create an easy kind of uh, customer experience. We want it frictionless. Now, actually, that's very dangerous from a psychology point of view. Okay, so think about it. You have a brain. It's the biggest muscle in your body. Uh, it actually demands lots of attention. And it wants to do stuff for actually getting feedback that it's worth doing stuff. So it's about ego. Okay, the more you do something, the more you actually make effort, the more you have value. The more you invest, the more you see value in it. Okay, look at relationships. I'll give an example. Let's say you kind of walked out of your home one day and you know a beautiful person came up to you, threw, threw themselves at your feet and said, I'm yours. And you're like, oh, okay, great. And then three months later, it all went wrong and fell apart and you broke up. 
And you're probably going to think, oh, well, you know, easy come, easy go, whatever. I'm not too bothered about that. Yeah, if you stalk someone for six months and you put a lot of effort into kind of trying to persuade them to kind of go out with you, if after three months that went wrong, you would probably be devastated emotionally. Okay, so the, the kind of flippant points, but yeah, I think you get the, the kind of the meaning that I'm trying to get to you is that actually frictionless and effortless, you have to be really careful with because there is worth in making effort. And another example I'll give you, which we've shown a lot of holiday providers, is that actually you should not make buying a holiday that easy. Or I'll rephrase that. You shouldn't let searching for a holiday be that easy. Because probably three quarters of the positive emotions about looking for a holiday are the anticipation. You've had a bad day at work, I'm gonna go online and look at lots of holiday pictures and places where I could go. I'm feeling quite nice about this and I'm picturing myself in these lovely kind of places. And it's all about that anticipation. Now, if I land on a site and it says, right, you've got three minutes to make a choice, you've got four options, off you go. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. hang on a second. Emotionally, that I don't feel comfortable with that and that's certainly not what I've got online for. Okay, I wanna kind of anticipate this, I wanna savor the moment really. Now, where it becomes effortless is once the, the, sort of you've made a decision here. Okay, so I've chosen a holiday. Now I want it to be easy and effortless to pay for. Okay, so there's a slight distinction. So in the customer journeys, not everything has to be effortless. You have to think about where effort should be put in because that creates value and where you should actually have it frictionless where people just want to get across the line and do it. Okay, and the holiday spaces are quite a nice example to show you that actually you need both things in place there to create kind of a more positive engagement for the consumer. And that's because we've got two parts of our brain here. So we have a very kind of, if I turn sideways, you can see my head hopefully, I've got the perfect head. I used to have an afro this morning, but I shaved it off just for this workshop to show you this. Okay, so this part of my kind of brain here is my frontal lobe. You can see it's not very big. Not for me, but not for everyone who's a human in general as well. So that part there is quite small. Okay, that's your frontal lobe. It's called your central executive. This is all, all about facts and figures. So this part of your brain is really interested in numbers. It wants to be convinced by facts. Now I'll go back to my original point. This is quite small. This part of the brain is quite big. And this part of the brain, which is the dominant part of your brain, probably 80% of its function is all about how you feel about something. Okay, so I'd be given a number. How do I feel about that number? It's not the number that convinces me, it's my reaction to it. Okay, so this is what we need to do. We need to focus much more on this area. We don't ignore this area but we need to bring this area in as well, because if we only do pragmatic stuff, so if we're only producing pragmatic kind of brand solutions, digital stuff, marketing stuff, then you've got about a 20% chance that it's gonna work. If I bring in the limbic system as well, I've actually really opened up the opportunity here and that actually I'm gonna get some relevant traction. I've actually increased the chances that the consumer I'm targeting is going to be interested because I'm now appealing to two systems, the, the rational system and the limbic system, which is a much more emotional kind of processed area. So look, we did this for Aviva. Okay, so Aviva were interested in looking at their customers and how customers view the insurance world. And we showed them very quickly that Aviva used to lead on things like pricing, you know, that we give you the best rate over the year for your car insurance or your house insurance, and we can beat the competition. They were doing what everyone else was doing. And so it was just, you know, getting a really kind of shout fest out there about who's, who's cheap and who's not cheap. Now, that doesn't do anything for me because, if, you know, as a consumer, if people start shouting at me or giving me lots of numbers, I get confused. Actually, that, what you're doing is you're actually putting a lot of mental load on that customer to actually go away and do a lot of work. Well, Aviva are telling me this thing, L and V are telling me this thing, you know, legal and general are doing this, Churchill are doing this. Oh my goodness, it's confusing. 
So actually what we did is we went out, looked at a lot of consumers and thought, what is it about insurance that we could change here? And there are a number of things. So what we know about insurance is it's, it's kind of steeped in negative emotions. From the moment you think about getting insurance, because now you've got to pay some money, and you get asked lots of hard questions. What are the locks on your house? How do I know? Well, why don't you know? It's your house. Now you start feeling stupid. So what happens is that a lot of these brands were making their customers feel stupid before they even actually parted money with them. Now, if you're gonna make me feel stupid, that's not comfortable. I'll probably wanna go somewhere where I don't feel so stupid. So what we did with Aviva is we actually changed the whole customer journey a little bit. And what we were saying, we were actually asking the customer what they needed rather than what we needed as a brand to make sure that we were covered. So we didn't ask about locks, we didn't ask about security, we didn't ask about if their car was parked on the drive initially. Okay, it was all about what is it you need and why do we need insurance? This is the emotional reason why they're looking for this product. Is it to get safety? Is it to get reassurance? Is it to protect what they have? Is it to go out and do new things because they know they've got cover? So there's the difference there, you know, gain and maintain, different kind of mentality there. And then we produced, helped produce lots of adverts. And you've probably seen some of these, especially if you're in the UK, for example, where we had someone being interrogated uh, about you know, their home, uh, and that's how you make customers feel, is interrogation. And then we kind of also found out that customers felt very kind of second class if they're an existing customer, and yet the new customers were getting a better deal. And this kind of happened about three years ago where we kind of rethought the whole thing. And as a consequence, lots of insurers now have followed suit. But it was really kind of quite innovative at the time about how we kind of thought about the insurance process in an emotional way rather than a kind of pragmatic way. Another example of this is where we won uh, Sage, which is a, an accountancy kind of uh, brand uh, for uh, uh, an agency in London. Okay, so it was quite a competitive pitch. Lots of agencies were going for this. The majority of agencies went, ah, okay, so accountancy. So this accountancy kind of uh, service will allow the person to then expand and grow and dominate because they've got their, you know, the system sits behind them, doesn't, they haven't got to worry about it and they can concentrate on world domination. We were the only people to suggest to one agency that actually forget all that stuff. Actually, small business to medium business people, it's all about ownership and control. It's their baby, okay? So they want, some saying it, they want to be looking over the shoulder about what's going on here. They don't want to defer it off to some automated system. That's quite risky because they spent a lot of time and effort setting this business up and taking it where it is. They want to be for, foremost in front of stage looking at what's going on. So we actually, rather than say what they might gain, we actually went with what you would maintain if you went with Sage. And it won the pitch and also, it produced some very significant marketing and retention and growth figures for Sage as a consequence, because they then repositioned the brand, and I think they're still working on a second kind of wave of this, uh, in terms of how they see their clients and how they might engage with them. Again, without the psychology stuff, we wouldn't have known this. So the second thing then, the second area that I'd like to cover is all about why are our brains not like computers? And I have to apologize here because I'm going to make you or some of you feel a little bit silly. OK, and don't worry. When I did this, I did exactly the same. There is a little light at the end of the kind of tunnel, though. I'm going to kind of build up your confidence and your ego towards the end as well. So just play along with me here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some things and I'm going to get you to think about them. OK, so. I just caveat it slightly so you're not feeling too bad in the fact that. It's quite strange in the fact that we think we are quite aware of all the decisions we make in a day. Okay, so we're all quite smart people on here. Even smart people, look at where it's weighted. You make significantly more non-conscious decisions than you do conscious. In other words, you are much more unaware why you've reached the decision than you are aware of the ones that you've reached. Okay, that's crazy, but this is, this is true and this has been proven in the last 12 years of neuroscience. 
that people are just not aware why they make decisions. So if you, if you do standard stuff like asking them or giving them a survey or a questionnaire, or even interviews, if you don't do it properly, you are going to get white noise back and you're going to probably be led down a kind of a dead end alleyway that actually has no relevance to what you actually really need to do. So let's show you some examples here. So very quickly, I want you to look at this sentence here and I want you to think how many letter F's are in this sentence. Right, I've given you a bit of time there. I've given you too long, actually. You should have literally thought about it in the first few minutes. Okay, so how many of you have got three Fs? Just put your hand up if you've got three Fs. Very good. Anyone got less than three Fs? Okay, got less than three Fs. Who's got four Fs? Okay, nice. Anyone got five? Uh, interesting. Anyone got more than five? Some of you putting your hand up twice, hedging your bets. That's what I like to see in front of a psychologist. I, I won't judge. Right, there are actually six Fs in this sentence, and some of you now are going to start wrinkling your faces up and going, huh, what? Right, let me point them out to you. So you probably got the finished files. That was quite easy. Some of you might have got the scientific. How many of you got the OVs? Right, some of you got them great, a lot of you didn't. Now, think about this. You guys produce lots of quite detailed agency output. If I can show you that you can go wrong in interpreting one quick thing in one sentence, imagine what your audience is doing when you're giving them much more complex things to consider. How much error are we now introducing in terms of what they're interpreting? And this is why things go wrong, because we're thinking that the brain is very computational. What I show you is what you're going to take away from it. And think about your, your conversations with your friends and your kind of uh, partners. This is why conversations go wrong. You say something that you think is quite clear and it gets mis misinterpreted. And you're thinking, what, how did you, what's going on there? How did you reach that conclusion? That's quite simple what I said. And yet it's a completely different thing that's misinterpreted. And this is exactly the point I'm trying to make with consumers in the fact that just because you build something and you think it's quite simple, I'm showing you here that even with simple instructions and a simple stimulus, you can go wrong quite quickly. So let's try something else. I'm now going to give you a few slides that have some information about some you know, individuals on them. I want you to look at them and very quickly decide whether you like the sound of them or not. Are they interesting? Would you like to meet them? Okay, so you give a zero to those people that you don't want to meet and a 10 to those that you'd really like to kind of, they sound really interesting. And anywhere in between is fine. Okay, so a zero to 10. I'm gonna flash these up quite quickly to move through with speed. So first one, this person's mother was involved in drug trafficking. So you might want to write the number down on a piece of paper or keep it in your head. Second person, this individual likes to ask celebrities to pose with cuddly toy bears. What do you think about that person? I'd probably split you on that. This person released 20 albums in multiple languages. Passionate about the environment and has invested in clean transport initiatives. This one will definitely cut the audience. This person installs secret rooms into every new home they buy. And I'm going to change the stimulus slightly now. Last one. What do you think of this person? So, who had a range of scores here? So who had, did anyone have the same number? Anyone have the same number? 
No? So most of you had different numbers, correct? Okay, now, the shocking thing is that all of those things are about Jackie Chan. Now, who feels foolish? Right, I'm making a point here. Depending on what information I show you, I can evoke different emotions on, on your part, which will either get you to engage or disengage with it. And this is why we have to be so, so careful with the outputs that we produce, because if we're not careful, we can actually think we're creating the right thing and actually we're creating the wrong thing. So I might be trying to create a number nine and you guys are going, this is a number three for me because I'm just not feeling it. It's just not on my radar. OK, so if you look at the cuddly toy thing, some of you were quite like that and others of you probably find that quite creepy. And that's exactly where you have to really be quite careful. OK, thinking about what do I do in that space emotionally to actually get that engagement with my kind of audience. So and this is because you've got two systems here and you've probably heard of this sort of stuff. So you've got this very quick system. So this is where we do first impressions. And, you know, everyone tells me, no, I don't judge people by the way they look or they sound, which is a load of rubbish because we all do it. And that's what humans do. And that's because we have this really, really influential subconscious system. You do. So the person who walks in a room with orange trousers, you know, many of you will be like, are they on a dare? Uh, are they down to their last pair of trousers and all the rest are in the wash? What on earth they got orange trousers on? You all make a very quick judgment on that. And that's the same with the, the consumer audience. They make very quick decisions on what you show them. They don't give you time. They don't make much effort because they're juggling other things. So it's really, really critical that we actually create that emotional relevancy very quickly. Okay, there's a really interesting quote here that's saying, if you don't measure the non-conscious, then you're literally trying to see the customer audience with an eye patch on or at worst a sack over your head. And I quite like that quote because that's what's going on. You're not getting the reality of what you need to do here. So we have a system here that's called emotics that allows us to measure this non-conscious kind of space. Okay, and I'm gonna give you a quick example. So I'm gonna use Quorn, which is a, a, a vegan vegetarian kind of brand. So they do meat alternative and they wanted to test out a new kind of brand positioning phase. They wanted to know whether should they actually be positioning themselves as vegetarian? Should they be positioning themselves as uh, sustainable or eco-friendly or vegan or fat free? What's the thing that actually gets people to engage with them? They weren't sure. OK, so they had done a little bit of research. And they did understand that people did associate them with low fat and they were meat free and actually people did like the versatility of them and actually they were alternative to, to meat. And from a little bit of their social kind of media, they did understand that the consumers were talking about being healthy, that obviously that it was vegetarian and vegan. So they had seven things that they kind of thought were intriguing. When we did a little bit of a psychology dive and actually did some psychology interviews with some of the target consumers. We also found these things that they'd missed. So both the agency they were working with and the client had missed these potential things that might act as engagers. So things like sugar free, things like actually people were saying that these things were quite filling and satisfying, something that corn were not making any kind of thing of. So now we have a long list of things that could be relevant. But actually, we don't know which one is relevant. And we certainly don't know which one is going to create that most engagement. And this is where the tool that we use comes into its own here and has real strength. I can look at these things at both a conscious and a non-conscious level, not only find out what people are saying about those things and the strength of impact they're having about leaning in or leaning away from the brand, but I can put these in a hierarchy in terms of their impact of engagement. OK, so look. I put all the words around the edge and you'll see two colored lines in this tool. Okay, we have a red line and a blue line. Now the nearer the colored lines are to these concepts, the more they're having a positive engagement on the consumer. Okay, so ignore the red line for a while, look at the blue line. The blue line is what they tell us. Okay, so they tell us, for example, that yes, I, you know, corn's low fat, it's eco-friendly, it's natural, it's vegan, and it's meat-free. 
Now, if I just left it at that, I would think, right, brand campaign. I'll go about meat free, it's natural, low fat, and it's eco-friendly. Bang, got it, off we go. Now, if you look at the non-conscious reactions, they are slightly different. Actually, we have got high reactions in alternative, healthy, low sugar, something I'm not mentioned yet, and eco-friendly even more so than they're reporting and low fat even more so than they're reporting. However, they are not actually, they're telling me that it's kind of not alternative, but they actually think it is, for example, and they're telling me, this is weird, they're telling me I think it's meat free product, but actually from an emotional level, they're not sure. What's going on there? Corn's a vegan brand, why are they not sure whether this is meat free? What's going on in the communications? So this allows me to check whether I have a brand positioning, brand strategy, brand message that is gonna work, that's gonna gain traction. And it allows me to sift through all these concepts and work out which ones might work and which ones won't. So I can create this traffic light approach to go, right, alternative does work at a non-conscious emotional level. Versatile and meat-free doesn't. Now I can work out what my messaging might be. And as a result of this, we've got a 17% increase in sales. The biggest ever jump they've had in their kind of market growth. And that's because I'm bringing the non-conscious in. I'm actually getting a far more accurate read on what consumers want. If I just ask them, because people think they're much more conscious than they are, they'll just tell you the conscious part. I need to bring in the non-conscious part too. And not only did it have kind of sales market growth, what happens with these outputs is you can see they're useful for marketing because I know what message to do. They're useful for retention because I need to kind of know what to keep saying to these people to keep them. So if I know the points of traction, I know what things to feed into these forms of communication. I know what to design from a, a digital point of view. I know what emails to send out, for example. And I can track this. This is one of the kind of missing parts for agency and I guess you get off of this a lot. How can you show me what you did changed anything in the customer space other than the sales increase? And this is what we can do. We can show clients that the emotional world has changed in front of the consumer. I can actually measure with a 90% statistical accuracy what's happened when you've released your marketing campaign or when you've done your digital piece. Can we demonstrate that we've actually got an increase in affordability or value or trust and our tools can show you that and I think this has been really useful for agency ammunition to show people hey it's working and here's the evidence and I think a lot of the time a lot of the evidence is just based on did the sales increase or not this actually measures the impact on the emotional landscape of the consumer so I'm conscious of the time I'm going to whiz through these much more clearly and quickly customer segmentation it's unnecessarily complex at the moment. Okay, all these things that you might measure are actually quite unreliable from a scientific point of view, even personality, which sounds really weird coming from a psychologist, doesn't it? But personality, who you are now is who, not who you are this afternoon. And who you're with and in what context also wobbles it around. So if you think you're measuring personality and that's actually differential and gonna give you accurate information, you might wanna think again it doesn't. Attitudes. You know, what I say I'm going to do and what I'm going to do, there's absolutely no correlation there. Okay, so stated intent is actually quite unreliable in measuring what consumers might do. Demographics don't tell you the why. Seeing what people do don't tell you the why. Okay, if someone just does something, puts something in a basket and takes it out again, doesn't tell you why they've done it. So we need to know the whys. So let's ask you a quick question. If I could beam you to this beach, where would you be? What, what part of the beach would you like me to beam you to? Have a think about it very quickly. So many of you might have chosen this area and this is where brands and agencies often go wrong because this is the nice immediate reward, isn't it? I'm going to feel the sun on my skin, nice cool water on my kind of feet or I might even go in for a swim. That's the immediate gain. However, I would imagine that a significant number of you might have chosen this part, which is the longer burn here. I'm more interested in the, where is this experience going to take me? What are the opportunities behind the hill? What can I see? 
I've got a good vantage point here. I'm in control. So brands need to think about that bit. And the third area they certainly don't kind of uh, pay attention to is the risk. So those of you who are in the water, how many of you are now going to get out of the water when I say, well, what, I don't know what's in here? Could be a shark, could be something very dangerous in here. I haven't told you that yet. You might want to get out of the water until I tell you what the risk is. So one of the things that we get really confused about is the fact that we try and sell, sell, sell the positives. Human brains are wired to receive negative information actually twice as quickly as they are positives. We want to know what the risks are before we then consider the positives. So if you're a smart brand, what you will do is you will tell your audience what the risks might be, but how as a brand you've removed them. Because now you're being transparent, you're being normal, you're being kind of a normal human that has errors and has good things. So many brands just churn and tell people about how positive they are, okay? It's a bit like going on a date. Imagine going on a blind date and you're grateful when the person turns up, but then they start just telling you how great they are for 20 minutes, don't even let you talk. I mean, how many, I wouldn't be going on a second date with that person, don't know about you. And that's what brands get wrong. They just constantly bombard their consumers how great they are, what they do right, why their quality, you know, why the product price is great. And, you know, everyone's doing it. So it's not differential and it's certainly not engaging and it's certainly not creating a kind of relationship with me because where do I feature as a consumer? I'm not allowed to say anything here. So one of the tips is, Try sometimes to acknowledge the negatives because you can then tell your audience how to get rid of them. And they'll actually like that because you're being honest with them. And the, given the fact that the human brain actually wants to see kind of what are negative, what are the threats before I do anything, you're playing into how the human brain operates in the world in general anyway. And this is because, look, we are more bothered about needs than we are pragmatics. So lots of people are interested in what your product or your brand might allow them to gain. Is it power, status, belonging, respect? Is it reassuring them what they won't lose? Time is even more important than money to some people. How will your product and brand save them time? How will it not waste their time? Is it new opportunities? Lots of humans are about self-discovery, about new things, about adventures. Where is this going to take me? So it's not the immediate that I'm interested in. It's where are you as a brand going to take me in the future? What doors are you going to open if I interact and buy your product, for example? And we have another engine that does this. with an, It's called a Neopic Archetype Segmentation Engine. And again, it uses non-conscious segmentation. The funny thing is that actually the world is only divided into four groups of people. And I know that sounds shocking, but that's quite true from a scientific point of view. Okay, we are all one of these four groups. Now we have elements of each of these in us, but the volume is set quite high on one of these. So some of you will have some of these elements, but you'll be quite high as a planner. You'll have post-it notes all around your computer. You'll be bothered about time. You'll have a diary. Yeah, if you've got kids, they'll be in after school clubs. You know, I can tell a lot from you if you're a planner. I can tell a lot from you if you're a sociable. Now this is great because if I know who you are, I know what journey you will go on as a consumer. I know what to say to you. I know what words to use with you. And I know what images to use with you at what points. Okay, and it takes four minutes to do this online with us. I can screen any audience and in four minutes, I know how many of these archetypes are in your audience. And then I can help you identify them so you know what you should be saying to them. So look, we did this with uh, Legal and General. So Legal and General at the moment are merging with l &V and they want to keep their customers. And we found out that they had two groups, sociables and planners. And we use this information to work out how do we message the sociables about this merger and how do we message the planners? And we suddenly increased engagement and retention rates just by knowing that information. I didn't have to do anything about new prices and I've given them discounts. I simply talked to them in a way that they actually were based on their archetypes, which is really interesting. So look, I, I can tell you what to do, the do's and the don'ts. I can tell you what tone of voice to take with these people if I know their archetype. 
and I can be quite precise with what I do here. I can take any piece of copy that you might give me and I can change it knowing what an, kind of a, a planning archetype should hear or what a sociable archetype should hear. And this tool has been really, really fundamental in changing traction with agency and their clients because it simplifies the landscape. Yes, I can use existing personas. So Ted Baker, for example, had 16 personas. I used Neopic to get that down to three. So I squeezed their nine into the three. They still had all their data and information, but I made it much more simple for them to kind of inter interact with these people. So it's really useful for them. Okay, so again, this 50% increase in sales was based on this neopic screening the ability to know what archetypes belong in your audience so kind of finishing off here we also kind of give too much credit to the consumer that they've got too much time to consider they're just sitting drumming their thumbs on the table waiting for your messages to kind of land in their inboxes i use the analogy of the date yeah the fact that you know when you do have a consumer in front of you you just bombard them with how great you are not the best strategy in terms of how you might get engagement and a second date with them. The other problem that we have is that we're all split personalities, okay, me included. So most of the time, I am oscillating between who I do not want to be seen to be to who I want to be more like. So the avoidant self and the ideal self. And your consumer group is exactly the same. So you are actually firing your, tar your kind of ammunition at a moving target. Your consumers are moving between who they don't want to be to who they want to be like, more like. Now, unless which of those dimensions they're more bothered about, your, the stuff that you do is probably going to fall between the stools and be ineffective because if you're messaging about how this can help you get to somewhere else, then it's going to appeal to the people who don't want to be seem to be in a certain way, but it might not appeal to the people who want to be seen more like something else. So you've got to be very careful here and how you position stuff because the audience is constantly wavering between these two points of information. Okay, knowing who they are and if they're driven by avoidance as opposed to being someone different, is quite crucial in knowing how your comms should be tailored to them. And that's because look, we're all busy people. We've got so many plates and things to do. We're spinning loads of things. So, you know, there are already a line of plates spinning with the consumer when your message and your design pops up with them. And what you're expecting them to do is drop all their plates and really pay attention to your one. But why should they do that? There's no reason why they should do that. They've already got things that they're thinking about. So it's not only that your message has to kind of persuade. The first thing your message needs to do is actually get on their attention radar in the first place. And it's not easy because we only have so much cognitive capacity before we get full. So there's a war going on here. And, you know, agencies and brands are all fighting this war about how am I getting the attention of the consumer brain here? And it's difficult because there's only so much energy that the consumer has. So look, Sony Music, they developed this really lovely all singing or dancing uh, staff development tool. They asked their, their customers what they wanted, their employees, what would be most beneficial. They used all that information, went away and designed it. They only got 9% engagement with it. And you can imagine a lot of head scratching going on. What? We built this based on what you told us. What on earth is going on here? So we looked at these kind of differences between what someone wants to avoid being like and what they want to be more like. And we also looked at the archetypes of the employees to work out how would you we position this new platform so that people see relevance to it and that they will engage with it in an emotional way. And when we worked with the design teams to change the language and the framing and the words and the images, we suddenly uplifted it to 65%. And this is purely based on talking to these employees in a way that actually was familiar based on their archetype. So I'll leave you with this kind of, I suppose, ending in the fact that psychology can help you in a number of ways across you know, what you might be doing as an agency in trying to win clients, but certainly with how you're helping clients with their existing work. So whether it's audience stuff, whether it's marketing, whether it's creative concept testing, design, behavioral change, 
Okay, the psychology can slot in here, and I think can be quite impactful. Certainly, it's another tool in your toolbox that you could use that differentiates you. And certainly, what we're seeing in the last five years is that the clients are much more receptive to psychology. I'm getting phone calls and emails asking me, which is a new thing. I'm actually getting asked. I'm thinking about working with this agency. Do you know if they've got any psychologists? So it's actually getting in front of the, in the consumer's mind. It's actually getting really kind of front and center stage here. Anyway, I've talked enough, bombarded you with stuff. Apologies that we had to whiz through that. Hopefully you found something that was interesting there. Something that you might want to think hmm, that could be interesting to take up. Uh, I'll end now uh, and I'll hand it back over to Paul. And I'm open to who would like to ask a psychologist a question. <laughs> now, there, now there's an offer for us Simon thank you I'll just go lie down on the couch I think um, thank you very much fantastic presentation really in, enjoyed that and I'm sure many people on the call did as well everyone was uh, stayed on for the end um, okay we're kind of out of time but I think Simon agreed to stay on a little bit longer for those that might want to have a chat with him offline and uh, we can stop the recording and you can have a chat with him but I just wanted to say thank you very much Simon that was great um, we are doing Wednesday webinars every, uh, every month now. Uh, there'll be another one publicized on our website in a few days' time. If you want to go to it, it's thenetworkone.com forward slash webinars. If you'd like to reach out to Simon directly, you can contact him by email. His email is simon at innovationbubble.eu. Uh, and again, this video will be posted on our website along with Simon's contact details very shortly. Um, if you'd like to know more about upcoming webinars, do feel free to drop us a line and we will get in contact with you as soon as possible. We will now open the floor for anyone who wants to stick around to have a chat uh, with Simon. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining us today. We hope you found this interesting and exciting and probably a little bit scary in the same way. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great afternoon, great morning or great evening. Stunned silence. That's usually what happens, Paul, after you've interacted oh, with the psychologist. Joel, Joel Davis here would like to say something. Let me just unmute it. Hello. Oh, Joel, you've moved. Unmute. Joel, I think you're on mute. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, Joel, Joel hear you. No, I thought it was very good. Thank you. Um, I guess the way we've always tested in the past was on the action so someone buy something or not um because it, it seemed like it's always we're always targeting the lowest hanging fruit fruit you know if they, if they buy then does it really matter sometimes why we just know it's scalable and the only issue is why is when when you when there's no more elasticity so you find an audience and it home movers or whatever uh so my, when i was watching your presentation i thought this would be great at the end of the elasticity of when you can't find any more people who would buy. I just want to know if you had an opinion about that. In other yeah, words, no, it's a good point, Joe. It's a good point. And I think what brands often do is they go for the people that they're comfortable with, but there's a whole other market out there, you know, that could be prospects that could actually jump into the product if we might reframe it slightly. We don't know whether they're not buying it simply because they just don't see it's relevant in the way it's being communicated at the moment. So I definitely agree on that. The thing about the, the whys and why the why is important is, is the fact that in terms of like retention and cross sale, for example, we've seen that if you do understand that why, you actually then start increasing cross sales as well. So because yeah. you then know how the customer's working and also you'll build up a better relationship with them because if you know the why about them, then you know how not to annoy them. You know what they're interested in. So it goes beyond just that product point, if you see what I mean. And what about a product that is a one-off product? Like um, something you might do once every five, 10 years, like move home or buy a car or do your blinds or something like that, where relationships are less important. A table yeah, tennis they table. are. We say they are, but they're not really. And the fact that, I don't know about you, but my friends, if they've had a good experience with a you know, mortgage provider, they go back to them. Even after five years. And I suppose it's the same with the bank. You know, you might take a, a, you know, a loan out or you might have some savings. Typically, you know, people might go back when they, when they feel that, that it's not the actual, it might not be the money and it might not be the savings. It's they felt that that brand was relevant to them, had their back, 
created the right emotional outputs. I think we kind of underestimate these things quite a lot. If there's time, can I ask one more quick question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, a, lo a lot of ads we do, we do mainly social ads, we do put offers on them and we do see very clearly an offer will always outperform normally and the better the offer than the non-offer. Your data suggests that we should be talking about some of the emotive subjects. And again, is, can you see my point? I, the the, the yeah, sales data I would say, from- Joe, what I'd say is you need to fuse the two together. I think hopefully that came across. So if you just lead with the facts and like just the discounts and the numbers, you'll get some traction. But if you also add in an emotional call to arms, you'll probably see that number go up. We've certainly done it all the time we work with clients. Their numbers have increased when we've added that emotional message as well as the numbers. Thank, yeah. thank you for your yeah, time. So it's a great do, If you can do both, do both. I think, uh, thank, thank you, you, Joel. And um, I think Genevieve's got a hand up there um, has been waiting. Go for it, Genevieve. I do. Thank you, Paul. Hi, Simon. Um, I'm Genevieve. I'm based in Montreal here in Canada. And I was, I was wondering if um, any of the work you've done has been at a global level. The reason I'm asking that is I quite regularly get asked by our clients, um, okay, how do we know if the way people react is the same when you're looking at, say, Europe versus North America versus, you know, how do we get to that sort of, is there a difference in psychological behavior in our consumers in different parts of the globe? Yeah, that's a really good question, Genevieve. And the, the, the Coke one I showed you was actually uh, Coke Canada. So we, yeah, we do, work, we do work globally. And actually, it's probably quite shocking to hear this, but the, the archetypes we talked about are uh, cross-cultural and cross-gender. So a planner, you'll get as many planners in Japan as you will in Mexico, as you will in Canada, as you will in Germany, Spain, Italy, makes no difference, Africa. Okay, so because they're, they're actually getting at the real deep levels of what drives people's behavior. And as humans, again, we're quite similar. Now, the difference, and you, you're quite right to think about that, the difference is how you then communicate to different planners around the world. So, you know, we might find that there is a big audience of planners that are buying our products in Japan and in Canada, but I would imagine the nuance about how you engage those planners is slightly different based on those cultural differences. That's where the difference comes in. But the, the stuff we do, so we often work with the big pharma companies who've obviously got you know, hundreds of thousands of HEPs all over the globe, millions of patients, and we often simplify things for them by using the archetypes, by going, no, you haven't got 56 countries and you need 56 messages. Actually, you've got three messages that work and we just need to tinker with the end product slightly to land it in Tokyo as opposed you know, to Frankfurt, for example. So mm. actually, yeah, I think we can, we can think because the world is complex and there's lots of different people that it should be complex. Unfortunately, we kind of fool ourselves a little bit. I think our ego's kicking in. I think we, that we're, yeah. we're really special and individual and I'm sure we all are, but we're actually much more similar than we actually give ourselves credit for. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, because I, I had a client say to me the other day, a client that came from France. She said, we wanted someone, we thought Canada would be good because you would probably be best in between all the different cultures to understand <laughs> geographically but um, yeah. okay that's great thanks so and, much. And related to that question obviously a lot of the time clients you know will say well why are you only interviewing 20 people around the world that's just <laughs> ludicrous and you're like actually science would show you that's not ludicrous because humans are actually very similar to one another we don't need hundreds of thousands of interviews actually what you'll get if you want to pay for it that's your problem but actually we could save your time and budget by, by reducing the numbers down because then you get data saturation you just get the same things that keep coming out after about 20 30 people even with a million audience because at a deep level there's not much difference between us all yeah all the same thanks so much simon okay do we have any more questions from the group oh tracy i think uh, let me just unmute you and hi tracy hi simon that was really great really interesting um and actually you just kind of answered one of the questions i wanted to ask we work in healthcare so we're a healthcare agency and that's one of our topics has always been so 
when they say an HCP or a group of HCPs, nurses, how do we get to them? How do we understand them? So it's really great to know that you've got that experience and things because we know the little bit that we've touched on is, is by using trying to do some personalities just to give us a bit of an insight. So, you know, our um, neurologists, one type of personality or another to kind of help us tell a bit more of a story. So that's yeah, really and, and this is really interesting, Trace. So if you think about cardiologists as opposed to ophthalmologists, so people are dealing with the heart as opposed to the eye, you can you can actually split them on the archetype here. So the cardiologists are what we would call individualists and adventurers. They're, they're really risk tolerant. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care, you've got a bad heart. I might be able to save you. If you die, not my problem. You had a bad heart anyway. If you, got, if you can't see or you're losing your eyesight, I could probably help with that, but I'm not gonna kill you. So an ophthalmologist is much more risk averse. Yeah. And so yeah, lots of different nuances in that health system. It's I really find it quite interesting. interesting. Yeah. But we have produced a number of white papers on why you don't need big samples for these sorts of things. Because to your point, and I quite understand, given the pharma world is quite risk averse, they want a reassurance, don't they? Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, I'll be, I'm gonna be in touch, I think. All right, I, I know I've got some stuff, yeah, I'd love to talk to you more. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the floor today for Simon? No, I'm just gonna put Simon's contact details up on the screen then, so if anyone who is here, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so, uh, yeah, there we go. So yeah, there's Simon's details. If you want to reach out to him directly, please do so. Um, you can always reach Simon through us. And um, yeah, great. Simon, thank you so much again. Fascinating stuff. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, yeah. everyone.